This episode of Profiles and Risk is sponsored by IAPath. IAPath, unlocking your adjusting superpowers. Go to IAPath.com. This is Profiles in Risk. Hosted by Nick Lamparelli. Every week, we interview those who risk life, limb, fortunes, career, and reputation, and those who work behind the scenes who look to protect and enlighten us about risk. You can find the show notes and other insurance-related content at insnerds.com. That's I-N-S-N-E-R-D-S dot com. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Profiles in Risk. I'm your host, Nick Lamparelli. I'm pleased to have my, was it sidecar, my, my wingman, Sidekick. my <laughs> uh, uh, co-host, Tony Cañas, and we're both pleased to introduce Kelly Donahue Pirro. Kelly is the president of Agency Performance Partners. Agency Performance Partners seeks to partner with insurance entrepreneurs who dream to take their business to the next level and beyond by relentlessly pursuing excellence in world-class service and sales strategy. Kelly, it's such an honor to have you on the show. I feel the same way. I mean, we've been such good followers of you guys and love seeing the book come out and all of it. So I kind of feel like a little kid on Christmas. Like, I'm psyched to be here with you guys. Oh, those, that's kind words. We, we are so thankful to you because I think, I think we've been publishing an article of yours uh, once and now twice a month, maybe for the last year. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, you have never missed. So, so out, of, out of everybody that guests authors for us, nobody's more reliable than you guys. So thank you so much. It's called an effective backlinking strategy that we're very <laughs> passionate about. <laughs> well, I, I, I was first, I think I first bumped into you from one of the articles that you wrote for Insurance Nerds. And I read it and I was like, wow, this is, she's really on point who is, who is this person? I've never, I haven't heard of her. Tony gave me uh, the lowdown and I, and I immediately said, she should keep writing because that is like great content. So I gave an introduction to you. I always like to allow our guests to have a little bit of an elevator pitch themselves. What's your ele- elevator pitch? Uh, who are you? Why are you here? Those are very deep questions for a Thursday (laughs) afternoon. (laughs) Existential almost. Um, So I always like to say uh, I'm I'm the person, the typical insurance person that fell into it. I, at 18 years old, I was a bank teller and we had an insurance wing and they incentivized us to tee up insurance opportunities. And I needed a lot of money for pizza and beer at that point in my life. And so I just got used to asking everybody in line and that led from one thing to the next to the next. Um, Did a brief stint in the technology side of insurance and then uh, started my own consulting firm. And um, really what we love doing is, you know, partnering with agencies to say, how can we push your performance to be that of like an Olympian or Michael Jordan? Because I think for a lot of agencies or business owners, you sort of get apathetic and, you know, the problems mount. And so it's really easy to just keep getting checks and get your, it's contingency check time. So, you know, you get $150,000 comes in, you're like, oh, everything's going great. And you don't realize some of the things or the frustrations, you sort of sweep them under. So we like to say we're sort of that no nonsense kind of come in and really tweak things so that they're at high performance levels. And one thing I did see too, we also, I also own two other companies just to kind of throw it out there, but I own a marketing and branding firm for insurance agencies. So we're really passionate about agencies building a brand. So like Tony was saying, you know, he likes the superheroes and that's part of who you are, right, Tony? Um, yeah. And you know, you get known for those things, but for most agencies, their brands are just so tired, dated, boring, boring. And they're not attracting, I know that's some of the things we're going to talk about. They're not attracting the right type of clients, but they're not attracting the right type of employees because when they go to their website, it's like yawn fest or, mm-hmm. you know, this is my grandfather's insurance agency, not someplace I want to be. And the final frontier that we're just adding on is um, we have a partnership to um, promote virtual assistants from the Philippines to come and work with insurance agencies to help take off some of that monotonous, you know, brain damage work of processing cancellations or ID cards or mortgagee changes 
get them all overseas, lower cost, um, and free up your people to do what they do best. So if you have somebody that's in sales and they're doing some of the brain damage routine work, that's not them going out and kissing babies and shaking hands. Um, so we're bringing that over. That's a brand new venture that we're just launching. We just completed a two or three day Slack chat that's going, that will be live before this podcast goes live. So anyone that's listening to this, go back to the Insurance Nerds blog site and you will find Slack chat number two, where we, this is the discussion that we had is uh, about agencies and the issues that they're running into. And it was, uh, I think there were four, uh, four folks that were on that channel and Consistently, all four, they all said one of the biggest problems is, is that agency owners treat it like the grandfather's agency, like it's an annuity check and it's money that just keeps coming in and they refuse to reinvest back into the business to do those things that you talked about. So I don't even know where to start, whether to talk about what do good agencies do right or to keep going on what do bad agencies do poorly. Let's, let's go into your success stories. What do, when you go in and you can uh, consult and do the right thing, right things to get the agencies really thriving, like uh, Olymp Olympic status, what do the good agencies do right? First of all, I mean, I can tell within 15 minutes of being in an agency what we're walking into. Like there's a feeling you get. And I think that that's really important for people to understand that it's not rocket science. It's, it's really, it starts with, First of all, the agencies that we walk into that crush it and take our programs and hit new heights are the ones that have a clear vision for what they want to be. So I have a clear vision for what I want my business to be. I have a clear vision for what I want my people to develop into. But if you walk into an agency and it's like, eh, we don't really set goals. Eh, we don't really do that. We don't really hold our people accountable. You know, and you just start getting these answers where it's very apathetic you know, you understand right now that there is two, twofold going on. One, it's uh, fear. So we call it FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So I'm going to be honest with you guys. If I made half a million dollars a year and I could pretty much rely on half a million dollars a year and go on vacation every six weeks and have my vacation home, <laughs> and have my cars, and I didn't have to disrupt anything to pretty much be guaranteed that paycheck for the until I retired maybe 10 years from now, and have an honest conversation with yourself, right? Like, would you be trying to upset the apple cart? Or would you be like, you know? <laughs> and and I, I think that the, the tricky thing is, is once you are used to that lifestyle, right? It's, it's very hard. Like, it's very hard for an agency principal to, to say, okay, for the good of the agency, I'm going to, to dial back my lifestyle to 300000 a year, right? When they've been doing this for, you know, 10, 15 years. Or I think sometimes we, we forget, like I like to put myself in other people's shoes, right? I see the son and daughter who's super frustrated and I can totally relate to that. I see the agency owner who's 60 years old and we miss that time to watch them grind it out too. Like there was a time where these guys went door to door knocking for insurance policies. I hear the stories of, you know what, my first job, they hand me the phone book and told me to cold call everybody. And that's how yeah. they grew. Like one of our clients dug grave sites at night. <laughs> so that is wow. And he got handed a phone book and he built an agency. And so like, I'm looking at it like from a perspective of sometimes we get frustrated and I, I understand because I get that, you know, the son or daughter or the young person trying to make change. But sometimes I think we forget that maybe they're tired, <laughs> you know, like, Maybe they walked that path and they sort of earned the right to coast, but what changes all that and that where, where both parties probably need to come a little bit more together is there has to be this person who owns a business has to have a vision for their business that they clearly communicate and set goals on. And then this person can help support the vision and the business based on what they're trying to get to. So it can't be no vision and can't be all vision over here because all they do is compete with each other. And so if the business owner is strong and says, hey, I wanna maintain retention at 94%, well, the younger person can say, okay, well, here's the five things I think that we can do to help support where you wanna be, and let me take the work out of it for you, and let me help get us there. 
Uh, but I think that, that that's one of the challenges. So when you say like, what are good agencies doing? They have that vision. They know where they want to be. And then they're looking for the resources to help get them there. But in a way that is um, copacetic to everybody on the team, right? So some of the fear that comes from the older generation is, well, we're going to upset Sally CSR if we do that. <laughs> and Sally CSR was at your baptism, you know. And, <laughs> you know she's, she's your godmother. <laughs> so long. And Sally CSR does nothing that she's supposed to do. <laughs> Upsets customers all the time. But Sally CSR was there the day dad opened. And there's a sense of loyalty to Sally CSR. And Sally CSR is burned out, grumpy, angry at life. <laughs> And the day that your dad retires, the day she's out the door too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, so from what you're saying, I, I have to assume that you've gone into agencies and basically because of that story, because of the, you know, the respect that you have to have for the grave digger that got a phone book, mm -hmm. uh, went door to door, climbed, uh, uh, went through two feet of snow uphill both ways. <laughs> They built, they built they didn't have a management system, like collected payments yeah. in people's yeah. houses. So they went through all of that. And, you know, there is a sense that like, okay, they're kind of entitled a little bit to a little bit of comfort. There had to have been moments where you turned around, like yep. there's nothing I can really do here. I, I can't succeed. I, uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to con convince this agency owner to do anything else than to just, you know, coast to retirement. So it's, it's kind of weird only because we don't like, they're not going to spend the money with us if they want that. Right. So like there's, there's a segmentation of this where we're sort of get weeded out, you know, that's a great point. Every now and again, though, like there, there, we get called in and there's that rift between the both parties and both parties want to communicate better to each other, want to set the goals, but they're just missing each other, you know, like ego pride, how we go about it. They're just disorganized and they need someone to kind of come in and say, negotiate the plan. <laughs> Are they speaking different languages a lot of the time? Yeah. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Like I, I feel like I'm the middle of Mark, right? So I'm 36 years old. I remember being 21 and headstrong and thinking I knew everything. And then you open a business and you realize, you know, nothing. And there's like 700 other things you have to consider. You know, so you might be thinking, we need a new website desperately badly. You know, this is the whole thing, but you're thinking in your head, we need to pay off my partner or we need to buy out a producer whose contract's coming up and that's $200,000. And like, you don't have the points of reference on everything mm -hmm. all the time, or you're not looking at it from the perspective of my wife is begging me for a vacation home and I need to get her off my back, <laughs> you know, like... Yeah. So I think that the, the, the idea, like when we go in there, there's a need and a want, but for everybody out there who's struggling and maybe doesn't proceed with us, I just give them this one piece of advice that rings so true in everything in life, which is, you know, you can't want it more than the person who makes the decision. So like if the agency owner doesn't want to do it, okay, like that's their choice. They own the business. They pay their taxes. They pay your paycheck. That is their freaking American right to say no. <laughs> okay. So then you have to decide, do you stay on board and you just accept it and do what you can, or do you part ways and take control of your own life? And, like, and I'm not one of those people who likes the in-between, like, don't feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> and and th that decision is, is, is one thing for a CSR who can just find another job. But if you're a producer that, that has a book in that agency, that, that's, a, that's, it's a messy separation, you know. It's, uh, but it's like, how much is your happiness worth? And you know what? It's only mm -hmm. going to get messier the longer it goes by. Yeah, yeah. You know, and sometimes when you become that serious, the other party may have a little bit more of a wake-up call too, right? But, you know, I kind of look at it like at the end of the day, you, you then if, that, if you really, if that's the key, like I can't move my book, I need this money, I need this income, you have to swallow that pill and not let it eat you alive. Mm-hmm. You know, because yeah. what are you going to do? It's like this guy is the owner. He's 100% owner or whatever. Like he calls the shots. That's how business works. Plus, plus you, you brought up that um, perhaps because of the way he got his business and because of who he's doing business with, as uh, Garrett White said on the podcast that just went live last week, he said, you know, his book's not vulnerable. Um, these are like church, his church friends 
Mm -hmm. not going anywhere. And mm -hmm. so to him, and, and, you know, some of these owners are probably thinking like, because it's my book and these are the, this is the way I, I've done business with these people for decades. I don't need to invest in a fancy management system or a, you know, a web system. And so they're just going to be, I guess, some accounts that, you know, it's a tough nut to crack. You just can't. And then there'll be others that might be more open-minded uh, to what it is that you're trying to propose because it, to me, what you're proposing is basically a standard business practice. You know, I'll give a, just a real quick short story. Uh, my brother owns uh, one of the best, if not the largest, uh, salon and day spas in the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And he got that way because they focused meticulously on branding and on culture. And they yep. weeded out the people that didn't fit their culture. And their retention rate is sky Ooh. high. They have a team. They don't have a team of people that cut hair. They have a team of uh, artistic professionals because that's, that's the type of employee they wanted. That's the type of product they wanted to sell to the market. So the training is through the roof for uh, the ladies and the men that actually work there. What you're suggesting sounds almost like the same thing. It just sounds like, you know, to get to that other level, you need a, a complete system of branding and everything else that goes in business operations to be at a, a very high level. I think you have to have a passion for excellence. Do you, you know, like, yeah. and then one of the things like I struggle with in this industry is, is like, I wake up every day obsessed about my businesses, like, like disturbingly obsessed, probably, you know, like paranoid, like, <laughs> And I'm thinking about like, did we, did we satisfy a customer today? Did we make a difference? Did our marketing kill it this week? You know, what's next? What are we delivering value on? Can we justify the cost that we're putting in front of people? And I think for a lot of agency owners, like you had called it, it's like an annuity, right? Well, if I had an annuity, I'm not obsessed with the market. I know the annuity is going to pay me X amount every month and I don't care. But if I'm bullish and I'm in the stock market, guess what I do every day? I obsess over where the stocks are. And so that's why I think that, well, and I will tell you this story. So, you know, we've been talking about these agency owners that won't change. Change happens to you sometimes when you don't expect it. So this morning I got a phone call from an agency owner and it was a very upsetting phone call. You know, in the past year, um, they lost a producer who was a very big troublemaker. So they sold her book of business to another agency and it was a blessing, right? Like it was a good thing, but now you're reducing your book size. They just found out they lost a million dollar account and this account was just high maintenance. You know, they had been financing their premium. It was just, it, it's a great revenue account, but it's, it's not a good account. It's not a million dollar, like, wow, this is a great account. It's, it was a pain in the butt, you know? And so then they're looking at, well, shoot, we're down $200,000 in revenue in six months now. Yeah. So guess what they want to talk about? Change. <laughs> Marketing, sales, <laughs> sales team. <laughs> so because their annuity now all of a sudden took a dip, yeah. you know, yeah. their mindset of I can't coast any more change. And these are 60 year old men, right? So they're looking at selling this business in five years and they're like, I can't sell it like this. That ain't going to get me where I need to be. Yeah. Uh, the uh-oh so moment. Sometimes change happens. And that's why it's like, if you're stuck in the situation, sometimes you might need to wait out for that change to happen to get more buy-in or more result too. Okay. So, so when I was looking, when I was researching you and what you were doing, uh, it struck me as uh, very consultative, but now as I'm talking to you now, it sounds like there's actually a lot of day-to-day -day stuff that you're actually helping them with. Like you mentioned the marketing and things like that. So you're, you're helping them with that brand with that message. And also uh, are you potentially also uh, quantifying all of all of those things as well and basically um almost like a a marketing arm for them yeah so um one thing that i'm obsessed with on the agency appeal company um is our brands are so freaking cool <laughs> like i'm just gonna be honest like we make insurance agents look like badasses like that's all i can say <laughs> Like, I, I love it when we go to a website because we do heavy marketing and prospecting and everything else. And it's like, this is, this is a standard insurance agency website. I have been in business for 150 years and I have 700 carriers and I am invested in the community. <laughs> 
And here's the stock photos of my non-existing team. <laughs> like <laughs> a multicultural <laughs> team at the boardroom looking very cute. <laughs> And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like, I have no idea. Like any agency logo could go in the top corner. But when we do brands, like there's a whole process to it. And we won't, like if an agency pushes back on not being kind of modern, hip and cool, we, we just say, sorry, here's your money back. Uh, like, you wow. got to go on a different journey here with us. Yeah. Uh, but our, you know, why agencies don't market, like you go back to like the old school thinking, they don't know how, like. Like the, the, the 60 year olds that I was talking about today, like they're not on Facebook and that's their choice and that's okay. Like, am I ever going to force them on Facebook? No, <laughs> like it's 2018. They've had 15 years to try it out. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> It's not going to happen, but it doesn't mean that they don't want that. So we actually have a program where we're, where they're outsourced chief marketing officer. So we call it, you know, and they only work with five to eight agencies and they're your person. And if, XYZ six year old wants to call up their person and say, Hey, I think I need to figure out LinkedIn. There's no shame in that. And then the person gets up and great, let's go for it. <laughs> you know, let's walk you through it. And then they help them. But if it's not your core competency, like I love marketing, it's in my DNA. I think it's in you guys' DNA too. But when you meet most insurance agents, they, that's not their thing. So why take it and force them into it? Let them have other resources to get there or those younger generations, give them and empower them to take it over, but don't be fearful of it. How much do you focus on the actual book itself? And where I'm going with this is Tony and I've been having our Slack chat conversations around personal lines agencies. Mm -hmm. Do you go in and recommend changes to the book? Do you go in and say, like, like that million dollar account, like it's, mm -hmm. it might be costing you more to have that account here than to not have it. Um, things like that. Do you go in and uh, tell them to niche um, and give them that kind of book advice? And we'll get right back to this podcast right after a short message from our sponsor. I'm back with Chris Stanley, founder of IAPath. Chris. When someone is interested in becoming an independent adjuster or independent appraiser, what can IAPath offer them? Nick, at IAPath, we recognize that getting people to take a chance on a new vendor or independent adjuster is challenging. So one thing that we do to help IAs is train them, certify them, and mentor them. We want to give them the skills to actually do the job and in turn give the hiring companies confidence to try out our graduates. We call these interactive online courses and mentorships boot camps. We also offer self-paced training videos and IA networking and support through our monthly membership that we call the League of IAs. Learn to write auto, heavy truck, and other claim types with IAPath's online trainings. Unlock your adjusting superpowers. Go to IAPath.com. How much do you focus on the actual book itself? And where I'm going with this is Tony and I have been having our Slack chat conversations around personal lines agencies. Mm -hmm. Do you go in and recommend changes to the book? Do you go in and say, like, like that million dollar account, like it's, mm -hmm. it might be costing you more to have that account here than to not have it. Um, things like that. Do you go in and uh, tell them to niche um, and give them that kind of book advice? So we try. There is this, I don't understand it, but there is this like headstrong thing in insurance agencies. Well, well, we place business where it's best for the customer. And I'm like, but if your commission is three points higher over here and it's within 50 bucks, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, but a lot of them don't think like that, but we do go in and we'll say, once we know what the vision is and we set the goals, then that's when we get into the strategy planning. So if you want to grow by X in commercial lines or personal lines, let's just say, then we go, okay, you want to do this. So let's figure it out. One part is retention. One part is new business. And then we kind of go back and we say, how are we going to back our way into that goal? So I can't do anything unless everybody's committed to the vision yeah. and the goal. And then we can back our way into how we get there. Yeah. But yeah. that gives us that quantifiable metric we're trying to target and hit. And then it makes sense to everybody on why they're doing what they're doing, that it's not just do it because I said so. 
And we're also extraordinarily passionate when we work with agencies that there has to be an incentive plan in place for every single body in the, in your organization. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I don't care if it's a jeans day because every agency works differently on incentive plans. Like everyone's always like, Oh, tell me what works. I'm like, I have an agency in Canada that if they made a hundred percent of renewal calls, so they called every customer coming up for renewal for 90 days, they wanted to do a yoga class. Perfect. Yeah. Whatever I works. I was going to give them a hundred bucks each. They want a $12 yoga class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm over guessing at what motivates people. So we go in and we talk it out and we get agreement. They, the team actually picks their incentive plan. Yeah. So, so it, it, let's, let's uh, be creative here. Let's assume that there are a bunch of 60 year old men listening to this podcast that own agencies <laughs> and you have uh, tickled them in such a way that they're like, Oh yeah. Well, if I, if I did lose that account, we, you know, things wouldn't look so good. Okay. So they're going to call you up. What does this look like? Is this, <laughs> It, like one month later and uh, all of the social media is up and running. I'm assuming it's a, it's a prolonged process, but let's give the listener a little bit of an idea of the timeline from when you first get in, what are some of the milestones that you're trying to reach and what, what's the timeline across that, those milestones? Oh, it's so varied, but um, you know, standard agency, it just depends on the product line that we select and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, it, but the, the, the core principles are, is that we're going to kind of assess the situation first. So everybody wants the magic wand and I have to slow people down and say, before we begin, we're going to kind of work up an assessment of what's going on. What are your current metrics? What's working? Who are the problem people? You know, and then set a goal and say, okay, now once we kind of get a handle on everything, now where do we want to be? And then we kind of back our way into that plan. So from there, it becomes a little bit of a variable where it could be that we need to hire a marketing person inside your office, or we need to make 100% of renewal calls, or we need to get a better sales process and start doing sales training and tracking. Um, but it, it always ends up to be assess the situation, set the goal, set the vision, get 100% buy-in on it, and then back our way into what the launch is going to look like. Um, and that just seems to work the best. I think it gets everyone's buy-in early on. Um, versus kind of ramming things down people's throats. It's like a doctor's visit. <laughs> you're the, and, uh, you're, you're the like doctor. More like a colonoscopy to some people, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you work uh, exclusively with independent agents or, or do, you, do you do something for exclusives also? Um, we mostly work with independent agents. We have some agencies that do a little bit of both. Um, so they're big enough like with Nationwide where they're able to have some open captive situations. We also work with carriers too. So I spent oh, okay. Tuesday, I was at a carrier in Michigan and they hired us to come in and evaluate their marketing to agents, um, which was very behind the times. Let's just say that. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's a good segue. Uh, so you have a carrier that's uh, looking for help focusing on agents. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you built a business focusing on agents. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of uh, tech companies coming into the market that would like to knock the agency system out and uh, do some kind of, uh, you know, uh, create value and, and absorb some of that into their business model and give some back to the customer. Uh, so you're making a bet on the agency system. What, what does I'm, the future of the agency system look like? Hmm. Consolidation. I think it's going to be real hard to be a tiny fish in a big pond coming soon. And I think that there's, so when we do our marketing, like one of the key questions that we ask is how many employees do you have? Cause I don't necessarily care about revenue. Revenue varies so much over the country and what you're into. I just want to know how many people. And I mean the under five people in an agency is probably 70% of the contact forms that we get. And it's hard, you know, your carriers are cutting commissions and, less, and, and some of these guys have been in business for 30 years and never cracked over, you know, a half million dollars in revenue. To me, like, and I'm, I don't mean to offend anybody, and if you're trying, we applaud that. That's why we give away so many free resources on our website. Um, but you've got to take a good look in the mirror if you've been in business for 10 years, 15 years, and you haven't cracked half a million dollars in revenue. Um, something's not working in the way that you're leading that business. Yeah, and and carriers are going to start phasing that out. It's not, it's not worth their time, right? 
You're not getting marketing reps. You're not getting co-op dollars. And you know what? Really, as an agency owner, you're doing all the jobs because you don't want to take a step back. Maybe, maybe you're making $80,000 a year and it terrifies you to go down to 50, but you need to invest that $30,000 into, you know, maybe, maybe you look at some of the options I said, like outsource virtual assistants that are a lot less expensive to help get you to that next level. But you have to start figuring out what jobs you're going to fire yourself from so that you can either produce at a higher level to get to that next tier or find someone to help, you know, produce for you. Um, but those agencies under half a million dollars in revenue, like I, that's where I think the, the first killing spree is going to come. Are, are there any other types of agencies that, that, that you think will pretty much disappear afterwards? Uh, so in, in my mind, uh, a, a lot of exclusives and a lot of, of exclusive of, of, you know, 80, 90% personal alliance agencies, uh, even if they're sizable, what do you, what do you think? I don't know. I'm, I'm a little different on the personal lines front. I think personal lines agencies will make a rally back if they're big enough. Okay. Wow. Why? why? Um, like you look at like, like GNN insurance up here by me in new England, like there are people taking personal lines by storm. So to me, the marketplace is going towards shop local farmers markets, you know, people love Amazon for convenience, but they're still doing a lot of local shopping to help support their mm -hmm. communities. But if you don't want to be doing the community stuff, you don't want to be out there, you don't want to be recruiting, you don't want to be seen, you don't want to be active, you're dead. You're just, you're dead. But I look at it like there could be a revival of back to the 50s and 60s where the insurance agent ran the town. I, I, I definitely agree with the, with the shop local thing. Uh, but I, 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 you know, I, we're about the same age, right? We're both kind of on the older edge of the millennials. And as I see my, my peers, uh, you know, buying houses and having kids and stuff and getting to the traditional age where, where people, you know, really need an agent mm -hmm. uh, and where people are a profitable customer for an, for an agent, they're not running to agencies. They don't know right? they exist, though. Exactly. They don't know. And they, they're they not need, aware of them. They, they need the advice and they don't know it. Well, right? I think and, they prefer to have a person that tells you, I'm getting my 16-year-old on the road. What the heck do I do? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so this is the, this is the, this is the key thing. People have to know the independent agency channel exists. And I'm going to say this and this might get me into trouble. I don't think any of the associations have done any independent agencies, any favors in doing this. So they take a lot of money, <laughs> they lobby it for it to be on government, but why the independent agent doesn't have a flow or a gecko or anything like that to say, go to your town, shop local. Mm -hmm. is ridiculous for the amount of money spent we should be able to get some celebrity to get on tv and tell people to shop local <laughs> <laughs> who would be and a I good one who would be a good celebrity for I, them? I, I i've got to say i'm available if anybody's listening <laughs> but uh, i think unfortunately I, I i could pass a celebrity only in insurance so i'm not going to help much with this one but you know like i mean I mean, here's the thing, you know, like Allstate is still my favorite marketing. I don't care. Mayhem cracks me up every time I see him. And then they have the, the guy that was the president on 24 with his voice that everybody recognizes. I love Geico. I, I love the commercials. I've never purchased from them, but I know who they are. I know they're always there. When someone asks me, where can I get cheap auto insurance? I still go to Geico. You, no. you know, you know who I would really like, uh, <laughs> Peter Dinlage. Peter, Peter, I can remember his last name. It's with a D. Oh. The actor that that, that Tyr plays Lannister. Tyr exactly. See, that'd uh, be so great. <laughs> right, right, and 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 he could totally play the the the. I might look little to you, but actually, I'm a giant, and you just don't know it. Can't, can't, because you need to sell that idea. You need to right. you need to copyright that right now. It, it, it just <laughs> came to me. Uh, I, I think that would be fantastic because it is true. Like independent agents are, are are huge, but people don't know it unless they're business owners. Well, and the problem is, is that independent agents haven't woken up to the fact that they have to build awareness about themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, and, and that's why I say, like, that's why you could own your community and just be like, oh, you go to so and so, he's the best. You know, it's like, how does a barber own his community? Oh, you go to so and so, he's the best. How does a dentist own their community? Like, and not everybody's communities are the same size. I get that. But you, you, and the only way you're going to build awareness is by being cool and having a good brand, mm -hmm. and be, having something that people can relate to. Like I always use it. Like we're not the only industry in the world that faces this, right? Like dentists, no one loves going to the dentist. <laughs> but 
my dentist did built a great brand and attracted me to go and I needed a new dentist. There's a freaking light up sign and he has a joke on it every week. <laughs> and the joke's really funny. <laughs> And then you go in there and on the ceiling is a huge Where's Waldo poster. So as you're hitting your teeth clean and you're looking up at the ceiling, you're trying to find Waldo. (laughs) And I know that that sounds funny, but do you know what I tell people? I tell people about that. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. It's it's authentic. That's the the biggest thing. Uh, One of of the best, uh, and I've I've never worked at an agency, but but, uh, I've I've served them as as an underwriter, a sales manager. And one of the best ones uh, is, is up in, in Northern California, and they're a small mobile home agency, uh, but they are so authentic. It's Barber Insurance. Uh, and, I know and Barber. So you, you know JoJo. He's and, the best. And, and, uh, First of all, I know JoJo, and I worked with her when she was shooting all of her fun videos. Uh, uh, no wonder they're so good because, yeah, exactly. They are, and, and if you go into the office, I don't know if you ever visited, but if you go into the office, they, they've got – the big fish tank and the dogs and yeah, exactly. And and, and it's just, it it is, it's not for everybody, but it is so who they really are. And they own that town. They own it. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I, as a, as a sales manager, I love going to see them. Uh, And and that, that's the thing that uh, they don't feel like every other agency. Mm -mm. And yeah, don't be afraid that, that some people won't like your, your brand. It's like my Superman thing. Yeah. Some people don't like it. But the people that it speaks to, they, they, they become raving fans. And, and that's what you want, right? Be authentic to yourself and, and connect with well, the people. That- I, I, that's so important, right? So even if there are people that don't like it, here's the thing. People like authenticity. And mm-hmm. so, Absolutely. Um, so again, uh, I interviewed uh, Deidre Wright. Uh, her podcast is going live this week and she talked about how uh, she worked with some, she worked with a woman that had purple hair. It was her thing. And so in a very conservative industry, um, you can get flack for that or you can be a rock star Mm -hmm. and then everyone knows who you are. So now you've differentiated yourself. So initially I bet a lot of insurance professionals were turned off. Now it's just, it's just her thing. And she's, She's a rock star, so it doesn't effing matter because she produces. Yeah. She does what she does at a very, very high level. All of that other stuff doesn't matter, but now you've differentiated yourself. Everyone knows who you are. So, you know, one of the things I love saying is, is that, like, you know, we think personal lines is dead, personal lines is dead. I go, so would you be terrified if I opened up a personal lines only agency in your town? Well, I'm not an agent, no. so it, no. it wouldn't. Uh, but you know, I mean, like, uh, I'm asking agents that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because when they get like all oh, personal lines, I'm like, so would you be terrified if I opened up a personal lines agency? Because I would shut you down. Oh, you personally? Them. Yes, yeah. they would be. Yes. Because you know, I'm like, because I would come in there and I would roll deep with money. I'd have a brand. I'd be at every community event. And I think we all overthink it. Do you know how easy it is to go pick up those recyclable? Um, grocery bags and go to the farmer's market and have a stand and hand out free grocery bags and have your brand all over the freaking farmer's market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is that going to cost you? 150 bucks each night. Yeah. So why, Reusable. why are they not doing it? Why, why are so few agents really getting it on the personal line side? Well, I think the, the, the problem is, is that the industry keeps telling them, Oh, personal lines is dying. And so that's why I always kind of, I kind of giggle a little bit when people say that. I'm like, who says that? Who told you that? <laughs> like, is there proof? Like, that's like basically giving up because Geico and Progressive have sucked the oxygen out of everybody. It's like, everyone's like, oh, I surrender. <laughs> I'm not doing yeah. this anymore. Well, if, if, I, if I were doing personal lines, it, okay, I kind of understand the, the economic pressures of mm-hmm. being a personal lines agent. I am not in personal lines. I used to be. Mm-hmm. If I were doing personal lines, I would immediately try to uh, use personal lines to get other facets of the business, like financial planning, um, com- commercial. Some of these, some of these people that I'm writing auto and homeowners have businesses. I would try to use that as an as an anchor or foundation to then extend out into other things. I definitely would not just remain personal lines, but I would, mm-hmm. or I would niche. I would like mobile homes or whatever, I would look to set myself apart some way where I can 
uh, branch out and, and extend the value of my passion. I think I people, I think people want personal lines to die because it's become a pain in the butt. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's like, uh, you know what, uh, you know, the carrier's cutting commission, uh, customers just call and want to be reshopped. Uh, and it's like, you have no plan. You've got no strategy. You sign a personal lines client and hope they don't call you. Or my favorite thing is <laughs> we're not going to poke the sleeping giant. We're not going to call them. I'm like, you're taking their money. You're taking their money and you don't want to call them and just find out they're okay. No. And then like, we do silly things. Like we don't make late payment calls. Like, we give great service. We give great service. You know, if you call in, someone will call you back three days later. Um, yeah. And, you know, the problem is, is that in Person Alliance is that the account managers in Person Alliance were once assistants to agents. And now mm -hmm. the Person Alliance agent has really kind of gone the way of the dodo. Um, they're asked to service, sell, run a book. And you know what? The agency owner really hates Person Alliance. So they never pay any attention to them. <laughs> And so it's like they're left to their own devices. They're getting screamed at every day about rate increases and no one's giving them a better plan, right? Mm -hmm. So you're just burned out. You're like, oh, maybe I'll sell my personal lines book and just focus on commercial. <laughs> my refute to that is like, how many $400 freaking bops do you have in your small commercial department that you're spending time, effort, and energy on making you less money than the $3,000 home and auto package? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I'm like, why don't you go pull those metrics and we'll figure, then we'll have a conversation. That's right. So uh, before we get to the personal part of the podcast, uh, I have one question that's broken out into two parts. I think we could do a whole show just on these. So I'm, I'm nervous a little bit of respecting your time, but <laughs> let's, let's give it a shot. Okay. okay. So we spent a lot of time about working on the operations, mm -hmm. but if there's no one to actually do <laughs> perform the operations, you have a big problem. And one of the things that came out from the Slack chat, Garrett White, who's uh, quickly becoming one of my, one of my better friends with his insights, you know, he owns, he's president of Blue Lime Group. They're a niche player uh, doing homeowners associations. And he said, account managers, he said, they end up doing everything. They become probably one of the most valuable pieces of the agency and the agency system for generations have treated them very poorly. The mm -hmm. producers get, are the superstars mm -hmm. of the agency, but they, you know, they're the heart and soul of everything that happens. And now we have millennials that you, we all admitted, don't even know that the insurance agency system exists. How are we going to replace the superstar uh, CSRs and account managers that end up doing all of the work at the agency? All right, so the first thing is we have to identify that that's a problem, right? So the millennials, and this is what I say, millennials today, this is what they, they live off of, right? Because I hit a button and things happen. In the freaking independent agent world, the process of an endorsement takes 17 different steps. It's like ridic it's ridiculous. Yeah. So a millennial's mind is blown the second that you meet. There's just not like a button. Like this is, <laughs> I have to go in the management system. I have to go to the carrier and then I have to call somebody. It's like, and I have to wait for it to come in four days later to check it. It's re it's our whole system and in the independent agency world is asininely backwards. Mm -hmm. We have a whole podcast about how I feel about insurance technology. If you want to know what's going to kill agents? It's our freaking technology or the lack thereof. Okay. So go ahead. Did you have a question? We, we, we talked about, uh, about the size of the agencies before. And I was wondering to be competitive on the technology side, how big do you have to be? To, to have the right technology to, to be competitive in this business today. I'm not convinced the right technology exists. Oh, wow. Ooh, okay. okay. So, yeah, this is a whole podcast. Yeah, we need a, a whole show on that. You yeah. Just but, um, up a yeah. I feel like, but, I, 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 feel like should I drop the mic? I, 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 I don't want to. Yeah, exactly. My, mic drop and move on. Yeah. I, I don't want to. I'm sorry I interrupted because I'm really interested in, in the answer because, I, like, as you know, I'm, I'm the generational guy, where, you know, in, 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 in our side of the business. And, and so – my opinion is, is that, and I've never worked in an agency, right? But my, 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 my girlfriend does work for, for a big broker in the, on the service side. And my opinion is, is, is that the, every agency I've dealt with seems to have you know, a, a certain number of, of 45 to 55-year-olds, almost always women, who are mm -hmm. the account manager CSRs, who are the heart and soul who run the business. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I see my girlfriend and, and, and her cohorts and I don't see them staying around and playing that role while the agents get all, while the producers get all the money and all the glory. 
Yeah. So we need to go, we need to think about this and this is, I'm just going to tell you what I think. Um, I think you have to get the minutia tasks off of these people. They can't do 18 jobs and they can't do them well, especially not with 18 jobs with 12 different markets, like training someone on insurance learning curve is so ridiculous because you're asking them to do a, a, like a plethora of stuff. So you need to start looking at some options for either service centers or looking at the offshore models of sending the work overseas to some of the things that are just minutia stuff. So that really the role is now an account executive. They are managing a, a $2 million book of business and that's their role. They're really more like an account executive on this book, serving people, loving them, helping them, not saying, okay, well today I have to go through this stack of mortgagee changes and I make 50 grand a year, but maybe I could make 60, 65 grand a year, be paid adequately of what an account executive at a the outside of insurance would make to manage a book of business because I'm taking all the stupidity off my desk. Now I feel valued and empowered. Um, you know, when we talk about the difference between agency owners don't really pay attention to the account managers, it's because agency owners are salespeople. So they try to like distance themselves from that as much as humanly possible. And they want to hang out with the other producers. But I always laugh. I'm like, you're high five and that guy for selling 40 grand. This person over here just renewed a hundred thousand dollars of business this month. You know, where are you, you have to understand that that annuity is really being handled by people they need to be empowered, trained, incentivized and paid fairly. You know, a lot of times they're not paid very well mm -hmm. um, for the job that they're truly doing because they're doing it 50% of the entry level work and 50% of the account executive work. And we've got to figure out how to get that stuff off their plates. I think uh, account execs, CSR, I think you nailed it. I, I, I would kill myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if I had to do that work again, when, when I first started, that's what I did. <laughs> and, and this was a windows, uh, a win we had a windows computer system and yet I was using a DOS based program where I had to do uh, commands to enter things in. Now I cut my teeth doing that. I did learn a lot. It was almost like its own training. You know, you get to, you get to like, I mean, when you're forced to type in mortgagee names and, all of this other stuff you, you, and, and to do manual rating through a binder, you get, you do get to learn a lot. Uh, I just, I, I worry about the ability of the next generation of agencies to hire these people. Um, well, you're hiring for a dead end job unless we change it. Exactly. I, you know, I just want 26 year old wants to go into a debt. What's my career future? Um, maybe if you could sell, you might be able to become a producer. I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So there's no career path. There's nothing. And, and, and most of them don't want to be producers. Mm -mm. But here's the thing. You're asking account managers today to be great on the phone with people, diffuse problems, love them, keep them, sell them on rate increases, and be the detail oriented person that's going to crush a stack of paper and policy check and all this. That's two different brains. Yeah, it's completely. Two different brains. And, and, and Tony, I would disagree with you. Uh, they may not want to be producers when they start. It, a lot of it might be because they're not sure if they can do it or not. Um, I, I've met with a lot of account managers that I think could have been better producers than the producers that were actually bringing the business in. Oh, no, no question that they would be better. But they producers. like the paycheck. They, they don't want the risk. Oh, sure. Well, sure. But, but so we're not going to be able to even get to my other question because we, you, oh. Kelly, you, you opened <laughs> up like so many avenues to go in. You, you <laughs> ruined the podcast. Oh my God. Um, the, the other question was about producers and that was another thing that came through on the Slack chat that we had was that there's a producer is basically they'll hire anyone that's got a pulse and then uh, they hire more than they can handle hoping that one person <laughs> comes through and can actually become a producer. And I'm thinking what other industry trains their salespeople that way? Like, that well, we don't asinine. train people in insurance, period. <laughs> like, it's true. No it's true. For account managers, there's no training. It's like, here you go. Watch a tutorial with Safeco or you know, your management <laughs> system and slap them on the butt and say, let's get to it. <laughs> no, and, and, and that, that, the, the way that we recruit producers and, 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 and basically leave them out to dry and just hope, hope that one of them magically survives, 
back in the nineties, uh, back in the eighties and nineties. Okay, so so each each of the producers, you know, the ninety percent of producers that burn out would badmouth you to their their you know five closest friends. Today they'll badmouth you to their five hundred closest right. friends, right? right? If you're on if you're unlucky enough to to have you know, a connector like me, they'll bad mouth people who are 13,000 closest friends. And that makes it hard for all of us to recruit and mm-hmm. to keep people in the industry. And that just pisses me off. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's table that uh, for another show. Because, <laughs> uh, Kelly, that was, that was awesome. Let me, let's learn a little bit more about you, okay. the person. Uh, what, what tools or techniques do you use to stay productive? Um, love, 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 in love with, we'll never break up with HubSpot. Um, love HubSpot. We use Insightly um, internally um, as a project management tool. I live and die by my calendar and my iPhone. So, you know, I'm one of those people that I need everything written out when I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it. And, you know, that that's my jam. I know that for sure. I had to get you on this show. I, I, Bumping elbows, just trying to squeeze our way into that calendar of yours. Uh, okay. And so finally. But um, that's how I make sure your article gets to you every month, too. <laughs> like now, clockwork. Now we know, Tony, the calendar. Mm-hmm. We need access to that calendar. Uh, Kelly, what books have you found to be influential in your business and or personal lives? Um, so I love Hug Your Customer. It's an older one, but um, I love that book a lot. Um, I'm currently reading, um, the hard thing about hard things, which is a business book about how hard it is to really be a CEO. Like all the stuff that people doesn't tell, it's not a motivational business book, like have team meetings and give incentives. It's like, no, like it's hard. Um, so I love that book. Um, I just recently read two, um, uh, what was it? It's about the sales line, Marcus Sheridan. Um, they ask you answer, which is all about digital marketing. So trying to figure out what's the burning questions on your customer's mind and writing content about it so that they are attracted to you. Um, Cause I think one of the things we talked about today was like that awareness phase. Well, somebody's worried about adding their youthful driver to their policy. Do you have a video about it? Do you have a blog about it? Do you have content that they can absorb to get to know you before they make that phone call? Um, so kind of like give to get, like if you're giving out good advice and content, people warm up to the idea of calling you versus calling Geico. Oh, and, and probably more importantly, we just, we just had this conversation on our Slack channel. Uh, when someone's Googling you, what do you want them to find? Mm-hmm. Do you mm-hmm. want them to like find like, you know, some random stuff or do you want them to find your content, which now it gives you credibility as a thought leader in the market? Well, they say now that before the phone even rings, like, 60% of the sales process is done. So, you know, and that's something so huge. I think insurance agencies have to embrace. If somebody's Googling, like, what do I do if I hit a deer or, or um, you know, do I really need workers comp? Like you have to be out there with all those content and answers. So people get to know that you're friendly, likable. No one's thinking, Oh, my insurance agent can't wait to call these guys. They usually have a terrible experience, <laughs> but if you can brand yourself online and then show them the way they're more likely to call you because they developed a rapport without even ever talking to you. It's actually way more efficient than the traditional sales. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I want to read the book, the hard thing about hard things. Um, most people don't understand the job of a CEO and they think that all CEOs are overpaid mm-hmm. and step into those shoes uh, that is, uh, I, I've seen some CEOs at large companies operate and it is a whirlwind, uh, when you're responsible for everything, yep. um, there's a everything. lot riding on every little decision that you make and how you lead and influence and move the company forward. Uh, a really good CEO is worth every penny. Well, and they talk about a peacetime CEO and a wartime CEO. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to put those on the show notes. I recommend, I'm going to, I'm going to read it. I recommend everyone else reads it as well. Uh, Kelly, you were a whirlwind. Um, we need to have you back on. We need to, we need to resolve the technology <laughs> issue one, uh, getting millennial employees. And then we never touched on the next generation of producers. And I think we could have some fun maybe doing one too on what really goes into building a brand. Cause I think that that's like this elusive word that no one understands. Um, until you go through it and then you're like, I have a brand, but most people, we laugh because people at trade shows come up to me, like, Oh, I have a brand. And like their font is like times new Roman. 
<laughs> like that's the logo, and like look, look, it's my logo, and I'm like, yeah, that's not even a logo, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for yeah, coming for on having the show. Me. I appreciate it. Tony, thank you as well for for uh, being my wingman. I couldn't miss this one. Okay, uh, my guest this week has been Kelly Donahue Pirro. Kelly, thanks again. Thank you.